All right, in this video, I'm just going to run through some of the questions um, on electrolysis and some of the questions on alcohols. Um, I've skipped forward to the six marker on electrolysis, the one about the core practical involving copper. Uh, if you need help with the rest of electrolysis, um, then you need to come find me or use your booklet. It's in booklet two from last year. Um, so this particular question here is common. It comes up a lot. They just find different ways to ask about the same experiment. Um, but you've got your uh, electrolysis apparatus down here. You've got impure copper at the anode, pure copper at the cathode. And what you're trying to do is purify copper. So you want this pure copper cathode to get bigger. So at the end of the experiment, you've got more pure copper than you had at the start. So you want all of the copper that's over here to move over here. So you've got one big lump of pure copper at the end. Um, gives you a little bit of information about the setup. And then on the pre uh, next page, uh, it asks you to explain three observations. So the first one is the size of both the anode and the cathode change. The bulk of your marks is going to be from explaining that observation. Now, I would say the only facts you need to know to answer this are the following. You need to know that the anode is positively charged and you need to know that at the anode, oxidation takes place. If you know that, then the opposite is true for the cathode. The cathode must be negatively charged and the opposite of oxidation is reduction. If you understand those facts, you should hopefully be able to work the rest out from here. OK, so you've got impure copper at the anode. So copper at the anode is present in the electrode itself. It is a metal. Copper is solid. It is just present there as an atom. And we know that oxidation, well, hopefully we know, oxidation is loss of electrons. So think back to oil rig. So copper must be losing electrons. And copper always loses two electrons. That you need to know because you're not going to be able to figure that out from the periodic table. But copper is going to lose two electrons. And when it does, it's going to end up with a two plus charge. And when it becomes an ion, it's no longer solid. Ions dissolve in water, so the state symbol I'm going to use is aqueous. If you were to write that half equation, if you were to write anode and then write this half equation and write the word oxidation, you're already picking up the bulk of your marks. Okay, but what's going to happen now is because the copper ion is aqueous, because it's dissolved in solution, those positive ions can move and the positive copper ions are going to be attracted to the negative cathode. So if you just wrote this and then just wrote Cu. 2 plus ions move to cathode or are attracted to cathode. Okay, so then at the cathode, what's going to happen? Well, all of these Cu2 plus ions are going to move over to the cathode because the positive is attracted to the negative. And we know at the cathode that reduction occurs. So reduction is the gain of electrons. Because copper lost two electrons, it's going to gain those two electrons back at the cathode, so it gets plus two electrons, it gets those electrons back. And when you add the electrons back, you get back to where you started, which is just copper as a solid. And what will happen is when those ions turn solid again, all of that solid will be deposited on this cathode, causing the cathode to increase in size. So we can say the copper ions converted, actually I need to write this because I've written this here, copper ions converted to copper atoms, you actually really don't need to write that because that's just that in words, converted to copper atoms, copper atoms deposited on the cathode. So that's why the cathode is getting bigger you're depositing copper atoms on the, on the cathode and then the anode is getting smaller because those ions once formed are moving to the cathode. Um, the bulk of your marks is coming from that, okay, so knowing those half equations. Um, the next thing you're asked to explain is a solid appears directly underneath the anode, okay. It says you've got an impure copper anode, so there are some impurities. The copper is going to be converted to copper ions and they'll move over here. But what about the impurities in that anode? Well, some of the impurities will be soluble in water. So they'll just go into solution. But the other impurities, the insoluble impurities, as the copper moves across, the anode just falls apart. And all of those insoluble impurities just gather here at the bottom. So to explain that, all you have to write is the insoluble impurities fall to bottom of anode. 
uh, it's often called sludge, uh, falls to the bottom of the anode as sludge as that anode breaks apart. The last thing you're asked to explain is the colour of the copper sulphate solution it does not change. So copper sulphate solution, you need something to conduct electricity. So we have the copper sulphate solution is our electrolyte and the copper sulphate solution is blue. And the reason it's blue is because of the copper ions. The copper ions give it a blue colour. Now, if you decreased the number of copper ions in solution, the blue colour would fade. And if you end up with more copper ions in solution, the blue colour would get even darker. But they're telling you that the blue colour doesn't change. And that tells you that the number of copper ions stays the same the whole way through the practical. And the reason is that every copper ion that you form at the anode, you then remove that copper ion from solution at the cathode. So there's always an equal number of copper ions in solution. Um, sorry, I was getting a little messy. Uh, but you would say uh, for every for every Cu two plus ion that enters solution, we can say that is formed for every Cu two plus ion that enters solution at the uh, anode one is removed at the cathode oh, i've run out of space but i'll finish that off with saying the concentration of copper two plus ions remains the same throughout the practical um there are a number of questions like this uh, if you go on physics and maths tutor all asking about the same practical typically about these observations sometimes they ask you specifically for the half equation sometimes they don't but i would definitely learn them if you learn the half equations, you're picking up the bulk of your marks by the half equations. Uh, it means you don't have to write as much in words when you could potentially confuse yourself. Uh, as I said, if you need further help with electrolysis, I know it's a tricky topic, then please come and find me. So the next question I'm going to run through is the other six marker relating to a practical. It's relating to the alcohol practical, which we are going to do uh, next Tuesday. Um, you're given this results table above where you've got a number of different alcohols. You're told the alcohol that you had at the start and then the alcohol that you had at the end so you can work out the mass of the alcohol used. And down here, you're asked how you can use this equipment to explain how you get the results in that table. Now, I haven't given you any space to write the six marker, so I'm just going to flip over the page. Um, and essentially, what we're doing here is you are comparing... Oh, there's a, you are comparing, this is 18 part two, uh, you are comparing different alcohols. You want to see which one is the best fuel. So fuel is something that when you light it on fire, when you combust it, it releases energy. And if it's a really good fuel, you don't have to burn a lot of it um, to get lots of energy released. So if we go back and look at the table, you can see that ethanol, I had to burn 0.49 grams of it, but if down here at pentanol, I only needed 0.36 grams for the same rise in temperature. That tells me pentanol is a better fuel. Um, but in order to, to prove that, I had to carry out this practical where I took uh, a variety of different ethanols in what's called an alcohol burner. So we use this alcohol burner because alcohols are flammable uh, and it's the way to burn them safely. You burn the alcohol, that's gonna get it to release energy. You put some water in the beaker above the alcohol and you measure the temperature of the water and you see how much alcohol do you need to burn to get maybe a 20 degree rise in the temperature of the water or a 30 degree rise. And just say for ethanol, you needed yeah 0.5 grams of ethanol to get a 30 degree rise in that um, beaker of water. But with pentanol, you only needed 0.36 to get the same temperature rise. You can say pentanol is a better fuel. Um, in terms of what you would have to say, there's a few things that you'd need to, to do, okay? If you look at the table, the first piece of information you have is the initial mass. So you're going to need to get the mass of the alcohol at the start. You're also going to need to get the mass of the alcohol at the end. So I'm just going to say record the initial mass of the alcohol burner. Record the initial mass of the alcohol burner. Uh, then you are going to measure out let's say 50 mils of water using the measuring cylinder that they've given you 
Uh, it doesn't matter what volume you say there, just make up a volume or say known volume. Uh, measure out 50 mils of water using the measuring cylinder. Um, place water in a beaker. They've also given you a beaker. Uh, and clamp uh, above the alcohol burner. Uh, light your alcohol burner and using a thermometer. So I'm just naming all this equipment that they've given me. So I'm using all those keywords. Light the alcohol burner and using a thermometer. Um, uh, record uh, temperature of water. Hold the temperature of water. Uh, wait until you have again make up a number. Twenty degrees Celsius rise in temperature. Then you are going to put out flame on your alcohol burner and reweigh to get the final mass. Uh, once you've got the final mass, you're going to do final minus initial to work out mass of alcohol burned. So that's you doing the practical once. Then you're going to have to do the practical again for the different um, alcohols. You obviously don't need to describe this whole process again, but you just need to mention a few things that you're definitely going to keep the same. So you're going to measure out the same volume of water. It's not fair to make ethanol heat up 100 mils of water by 20 degrees and only expect pentanol to heat up 20 mils of water. That's why you're using a measuring cylinder to make sure you have exactly the same volume each time. The other thing I've said here is clamp above um, the alcohol burner. You have to clamp them at the same distance. If you are using ethanol and you have the water really far away from the flame and then with pentanol you put the beaker close to the flame, again that's not a fair test. So they're the two main things that you absolutely have to keep the same. Um, so you could just say repeat with other alcohols using the same volume of water uh, and starting temperature of water volume and starting temp of water and keeping same distance from burner. And that will get you all of your marks uh, because you described how you do the method. We have mentioned all of this uh, equipment. Well, I said get the mass and mention the electric balance. Uh, but we've mentioned the equipment uh, and we've said what we would keep the same. Um, there are lots of questions that came up. It's a core particle. There's lots of questions that come up. So you've got a six marker on it there where you're asked to, to explain the whole method. You've got another question here uh, where you're asked how the remaining steps. They give you some steps. They ask for the remaining steps. You'll see so much of this homework is based on that practical because they ask lots and lots of questions about it. Um, so just take care, study the mark schemes and, and make sure you can answer all of those questions. Um, yeah, so lots of questions in there about that particular practical.